Welcome once again to our last viewing, our last presentation, and uh, how uh, we pray that uh, it will be a blessing after going through this series. And uh, this is the last of uh, our presentation in this series, not uh, to say that uh, this is the end of this matter, but uh, we want to pause at uh, this place. And uh, uh, we have been presenting uh, what are the principles of grace reform. And right now, I want just to look at, um, I want to look at uh, a world of confusion, a world of confusion. There, there is so much confusion in this world. And uh, unless the Lord intervene in this whole confusion, none shall be left alive none shall be left alive in fact we are told that um uh if these days were not shortened uh, no flesh should be found and if it were able the enemy will even deceive the very elect shall we pray shall we pray our heavenly father glory and honor be unto the name again we want to look at your word how i pray that uh, it may resonate with our mind and uh, we may see the world that we are living in, that it's corrupted and it's coming to an end. Help us to be faithful in accordance to the darkness. So help us to shine forth thy light in the four corners of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, a world of confusion. I, I have been presenting the truth. I want just to travel through some of the things that are happening in this world so that... Uh, we may be able to understand what are these things happening around us? What are these things happening around us? And so I'd like to share a world of confusion. A world of confusion. Now, confusion is Babel. And so this is Babylon revived. What was the at uh, Mesopotamia has been revived in this world that we are living in, the world that we are living in, what was happening at uh, Mesopotamia has uh, been revived and the Lord would want to save us from uh, every species of uh, erroneous ideas. So the book of Genesis chapter 11 and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shina and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go to let us go to let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, go to let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make a name. Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. Now, I want you to notice verse um, 6. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will, will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. I want you to notice that these people are of one language. And uh, the Lord is saying, because they are of one language, whatever thing they start to do, nothing will strain them. Even though God scattered them around the world, they are beginning again to be of one language, not because they dwell in one place, but through the social media, through the internet, and through the television, these people are becoming of one language. These people are becoming of one language, and whatever thing they do, Nothing will restrain them. And so Babylon is being revived. One language, one mind. When you go to Revelation chapter 17, Revelation chapter 17, you are told that um, these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. And so these people are becoming people of one mind and they are reviving Babylon once again. But in which way are they becoming of one mind? In which aspect are they becoming of one voice and one language that nothing 
that they set themselves to do will not be restrained through the influences in social media, through the influences on television and through the influences even these things are insinuating themselves into the church. These things are taking their foothold in the church. People are being uh, pushed to do things that we have never seen happen before. So a world of confusion, Babylon being uh, revived once again. I want us just to run through. Our Savior says, ye are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. There is a great work for us to do in the world and God will not have us to take our course to lessen or destroy our influence in the world. So we are the light of the world, but when the light is refused, darkness is what follows. We are told that uh, light has come into the world, but men love darkness. And so they are becoming of one mind. Uh, and remember, we are just looking at one aspect that they become of one mind and one language and nothing that is said before them shall be restrained and this is in the in the in the in the section of the dress but dress reform comprised more than shortening the dress and clothing the limbs it included every act of dress upon the person it lifted the weights from the hips by suspending the skirts from the shoulders it removed the tight corsets which compress the lung the stomach and other internal organs and induce curvature of the spine and almost countless strain of disease. Uh, a dress reform went beyond the things that we are talking about. And Saturn is in the business of wanting to bring about a moral decay. The people are becoming of one language. The people are becoming of one mind. One language in Genesis chapter 11, one mind Revelation 17. This is a revival of Babylon to strengthen the beast power for moral decay and when moral decay happens then the papal power calls for a, a, a restoration which is let us give one day to god let us not offend him and which day is that the sunday sacredness and so he is uh, uh, putting together uh, his people into disobedience so that he may bring about the purported obedience which will result in the mark of the beast. And so dress reform and moral decay that will bring about the, uh, uh, the issue of Sunday sacredness. All these things are headed to Sunday sacredness. Nudity in the church, nudity in the, in the, in the, uh, we have nudity in the churches, nudity in the world, and nothing that is set before these people shall be restrained from them. Nothing that is said before these people shall be restrained from them because the power that is working with them is the power from uh, beneath. It is the power from uh, beneath and not the power from above. When we see this moral degradation, when we see this moral degradation, even men, men thrust their chest out to display their strong pectorals. And then we have um, uh, people wearing, and this thing is not only affecting women, but men also. And you will see that um, these things are insinuating themselves even into the church. We read in Health Reformer, February 1, 1877, it is true today that the courses and dresses of most women are worn too tight for the proper action of the vital organs. The lungs, heart, and liver are burdened in their work. Every article of clothing upon the person should be worn so loose that it, raising the arms, the clothing will be correspondingly lifted by the action. But uh, this is the norm of the day. We have the light and the darkness and these things are mingled together so that um, the track of truth and the track of lilies are um, closely together and it can only be distinguished by the uh, people who have the spirit of God. Now, men are, are, are piercing themselves and doing all these things that they are doing. It's a world of confusion. People, do, people have lost their identity. This is how the world is. And these things, you will just find them in the church. Now, look, these are men. These are men. But what are they doing, actually? Here we go. And uh, 
th these things that happen to the world, brothers and sisters, this is a world of confusion, tattoos everywhere. And this is not, uh, these are not poor people. This is a style of dress. And you'll find them with the sisters and brothers who call themselves brothers and sisters in Christ outside there. Tight fittings, which actually are not encouraging their inspiration. Cancels on health page 92. You, you may wonder what is wrong with this? What is wrong with the tight uh, fitting or uh, slim fitting with men? It is essential to health that the chest have room to expand to its fullest extent. When it is like this, it cannot expand anymore. It is put together. It is tight until you can see even the cloth is just about to be torn about. So it is essential to health that the chest have room to expand to its fullest extent in order that the lungs may be enabled to take full as inspiration. When the lungs are restricted, the quantity of oxygen received into them is lessened. The blood is not uh, properly vitalized and the waste poisonous matter which should be thrown off through the lungs is retained. In addition to this, the circulation is hindered and the internal organs are so cramped and crowded out of place that they cannot perform their work properly. Now, you will think that um, it is only the women who are having problem. The men are having problem. Now, who will be the voice of the house if the men themselves are lost? If the men themselves want to wear like women like this, who is going to be the priest of the home? No wonder Satan has realized to overthrow Christianity he has to overthrow the husbands. He has to overthrow the wives. He has to overthrow children. He has to overthrow the whole family as a whole. And so this is his determined business that we shall never have a family on earth. Now, the church is a unity of or a unit of families. And the altar erected at home is the one that makes the church prosper. And so if the altar at home is ruined, then we don't have a church. If we don't have men who can act as priests at home, how will they become elders and pastors in the church of God when they have defeat, been defeated to do the work? And so this is a world of confusion. Men have become women and women are closely becoming men. The roles are reversed. The, the world is upside down. It is confusion, confusion and confusion. The high hill we talked about, the high hill prostitutes of Rome. In ancient Rome, we are told sex trade was not illegal and female prostitutes were readily identified by their high heels. Reference Wilson Nigel Guy, 2005, Encyclopedia of Ancient Greek, Greece, New York, uh, Rutledge. And so uh, I won't go much into this, but uh, I had just passed that. Again, many dress like the world in order to have an influence over unbelievers, but they are they here they make a sad mistake. If they will have a true and saving influence, let them live out their profession, show their faith by their righteous works, and make the distinction plain between the Christian and the worldlings. Our words, our actions, and our dress are daily living preachers gathering with Christ or scattering abroad. This is no trivial matter to be passed off with a jest. The subject of dress demands serious reflection and much prayer. Councils on Health, page 600, paragraph 1. In dress, we should seek that which is simple, comfortable, convenient, and appropriate. And so you look at this. are and these people are on children, by the way, is this not how they come into the church? Is this how not they dress even in weddings? This is a world of confusion. This is confusion. You cannot be like this and then say, that uh, you are not confused. This is confusion. And here we are. And so this is a line cloth. And uh, this may be extreme, but uh, here it is. A young girl, and this is how she's dressed. This is a beggar, and this is how she dressed. So you wouldn't even differentiate who is a madman and who is normal. This is confusion. We are living in a world which is confused. This generation has to answer for the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, 
uh, the people wearing until they will want even not to have clothing on them. We talked about, about Mary Quand, the inventor of many clothes, and uh, you can Google her. And in, in people dressing, at least they want to show something that should not be shown. That is, uh, that, that is the competition that now we are having. Confusion and confusion. Wearing extension, a sign of low esteem. So we are told, and uh, we looked where this hair is coming from. And it was being offered to the idols in India. And then... Um, uh, they expected blessing from their goddess or the god they were offering to. And then this was called a black gold. It was exported to some places and sold. And this is what uh, uh, our sisters, our mothers, our wives are wearing on their heads, thinking that they are becoming beautiful and young. But we shall see this becoming beautiful and young, what it really is in a moment. What robes God has beauty in us? What uh, robes God his beauty in us? And uh, now you will wonder, this is an, a hairstyle also on my far right. And here we are, so many, so many. And what at the end of the day it leaves is this. Some diseases that people will never even talk about about and so we are told that uh in uh, testimonies to the church volume 6 page 96 paragraph 1 the adultery of grace is a moral disease this is not just a physical thing it is a moral disease this is moral decay it must not be taken over into the new life now brothers and sisters we have to consider this very very seriously very very seriously and uh, i like just to read and reread this once again. I want to read this and uh, reread it once again. The idolatry of grace is a moral disease. It must not be taken over into the new life, that is baptism. In most cases, submission to the gospel requirements will demand a decided change in the dress. One of the points upon which those newly come to faith will need instruction is the subject of dress. Let the new converts be faithfully dealt with. See, testimonies to the church, volume 6, page 96. Now, talk about the lipsticks and finally what it leaves the people living looking like. We do these things and people do these things thinking that um, they will remain, they'll become younger and remain beautiful when they stop affording these things. Only what it leaves is cracks and not beauty. And so uh, I want us to look at uh, a certain letter that was written by Jadison uh, and uh, published by uh, James White about uh, this issue of dress. Just uh, this is a short presentation that I wanted to you to see that we are living in a world of confusion and God needs a people who can make a difference. God needs a people who can make a difference. And that person is you. That person is me. And so let us look at um, this letter by Jadison. Jadison letter on dress. To the female members of the Christian churches in the United States of America, and I hope that this letter will be supplied to everyone in the whole world. July 8, 1862, published by uh, James White in Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald. He says, Dear sisters in Christ, excuse my publicly addressing you. The necessity of the case is my only apology. Whether you will consider it a sufficient apology for the sentiments of this letter, unfashionable, I confess, and perhaps unpalatable, I know not. Now, Sister White offered an apology for addressing the issue of grace because she said this should not be hammered upon people. And she said that when the soul is con uh, converted, when the heart is given to Christ, all these things will fall in place. Also, Brother Jadison actually apologized for touching on this thing. 
there is no reason for touching on these things if our ladies were dressing according to the profession of their faith. But then we have to make an apology, not only to the church, but to the world, that we have not represented the God we profess to believe in. So, dear sisters in Christ, excuse my publicly addressing you. The necessity of the case is my only apology. Whether you will consider it a sufficient apology for the sentiments of this letter, unfashionable, I confess, and perhaps unpalatable, I know not. We are sometimes obliged to encounter the hazard of offending those whom of all others we desire to please. Let me throw myself at once on your mercy, dear sisters, allied by national consanguinity, professors of the same holy religion, fellow pilgrims to the same happy world. Pleading these endearing ties, let me beg you to regard me as a brother and to listen with candor and forbearings to my honest tale. In raising up a church of Christ in this heathen land and in laboring to elevate the mind of the heathen converts to the standard of the gospel, we have always found one chief obstacle in that principle of vanity, that love of grace and display, I beg you will hear with me, which has in every age and in all countries been a ruling passion of the fair sex, as the love of riches, power, and fame has characterized the other. That obstacle lately became more formidable through the admission of two or three fashionable females into the church and the arrival of several missionary sisters dressed and adorned in that manner which is too prevalent in our beloved native land. On my meeting the church after a year's absence, I beheld an appealing profusion of ornaments and saw that the demon of vanity was laying waste the female department. At that time, I had not maturely considered the subject and did not feel sure what ground I ought to take. I apprehended also that I should be unsupported and perhaps opposed by some of my coadjutors. I confined my efforts, therefore, to private exhortation and with but little effect. Some of the ladies, out of regard to their pastor's feelings, took off their necklaces and ear ornaments before they entered the chapel and tied them up in a corner of their handkerchiefs and on returning, as soon as they were out of the mission house, stopped in the middle of the street to array themselves anew. May the Lord have mercy as we read this. In the meantime, I was called to visit the currents. In the meantime, I was called to visit the currents, a wild people several days' journey to the north of uh, Maulmain. Little did I expect there to encounter the same enemy in those wilds, horrid and dark with overshadowing trees. But I found that he had been there before me, that is the vanity, the enemy of grace, and reigned with pecul a peculiar sway from the time immemorial. On one current woman, I, I encountered between 12 and 15 necklaces of all colors, sizes, and material. Three was the average. Brass belts above the ankles, neat braids of black hair tied below the knees, rings of all sorts on the fingers, bracelets on the wrists and arms, long instruments of some metal perforating the lower part of the ear by an immense aperture, and reaching nearly to the shoulders, fancifully constructed bags, enclosing the hair and suspended from the back part of the head, not to speak of the ornamental part of their clothing, consisting of the fashion and the tone of the fair currencies. Currencies. The dress of the female converts was not essentially different from that of their country women. I saw that I was brought into a situation that precluded retreat that must fight or Die. I saw that I was brought into a situation that precluded all retreat that I must fight um, or fail. And so there, 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 there was nothing but he had just two options, fight or die. Um, he continues to say, for a few nights... 
I spend some sleepless hours distressed by this and other subjects, which will always press upon the heart of a missionary in a new place. I consider the spirit of the religion of Jesus Christ. I open to 1 Timothy 2.9, and read these words of the inspired apostle. I also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with the shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. I asked myself, can I baptize a Karen woman in her present attire? The answer was no. Can I administer the Lord's Supper to one of the baptized in that attire? No. Can I refrain from enforcing the prohibition of the apostle, not without betraying the trust I have received from him? Again, I consider the question concerned not to the currents only, but the whole Christian world, that it is decision will involve a train of unknown consequences that a single step will lead me into a long and perilous way. I think you are reading together the letter of Jadison with me, this is 1862. It's not yesterday. This world was rotten back then. I considered the Maulmain and uh, the other stations. I considered the state of the public at home, but what is that to thee? Follow thou me was the continual response and weighed more than all. I renewedly offered myself to Christ and prayed for strength to go forward in the path of duty supported or deserted, successful or defeated in the ultimate issue. Continued on. Soon after coming to, the, to this conclusion, a current woman offered herself for baptism. After the usual examination, I inquired whether she could give up her ornaments for Christ. It was an unexpected blow. I explained the spirit of the gospel. I appealed to her own consciousness of vanity. I read the apostle's prohibition. She looked again and again at her handsome necklace. She wore but one. And then with an air of modest decision that would adorn beyond all outward ornaments of any of my sisters whom I have the honor of addressing, she took it off. Amen. Saying, I love Christ more than this. The news began to spread. The Christian women made but little hesitation. A few others opposed, but the work went on. At length, the evil which I most dreaded came upon me. Some of the current men had been to Maulmain and seen what I wished they had not. And one day, when we were discussing the subject of ornaments, one of the Christians came forward in my face and declared that at Maulmain, he had actually seen one of the great female teachers wearing a string of gold beads around her neck. You can imagine the shock of the preacher that this is an Adventist wearing these things and uh, she has been talking with non seventh day Adventists to put off these things. And this is the things that we face even today. And even with the pastor's wives and elder's wife, we are trying to tell the people put off these things. And when they come to the church, who do they find putting on these things? The wives of the leaders. And so... This was a shock to him. And I read on, what is that to thee? Follow thou me was the continual response. And I, I had just gone through this. Uh, I'll continue downwards. Lay down this paper, dear sister, and sympathize a moment with your fallen missionary. Was it not hard a case? Was it not cruel for that sister thus to smite down the ground her poor brother, who without that blow was hardly able to keep his ground, but she knew it not. However, though cast down, I was not destroyed. Though sorely bruised and wounded, I endeavored to maintain the warfare as well as I could. After some conflict, the enemy left the field, and when I left those parts, the female converts who were, generally speaking, arrayed in modest apparel. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. On arriving at Maulin and partially recovering from a fever which, uh, uh, which I had uh, contracted in the current woods, the first thing I did was to crawl out to the house of the patroness of the gold beads. To her, I related my adventures. To her commiser commiseration, I commended my grief. With what ease and truth, too, could that sister reply? 
Notwithstanding these beads, I dress more plainly than most ministers, wives, and professors of religion in our native land. God have mercy. So these people, their standard were the ministers' wives. And so she says that notwithstanding this bead, I dress more plainly than most ministers' wives and professors of religion in our native land. Don't we think that the ministers' wives have to set an example that has never been set? Because everyone now is saying, the reason why I'm doing this is because of the minister's wife. Those beads are the only ornament I wear. They were given me when quite a child by a dear mother, whom I never expect to see again, another hard case, and she enjoined it on me never to part with them as long as I lived, but to wear them as a memorial of her. Oh, ye Christian mothers, what a lesson you have before you. Can you dare you give injunctions to your daughters directly contrary to apostolic commands? But the honor of my sister, be it recorded, that as soon as she understood the merit of the case and the mischief done by such example, off went the gold beards. How I pray our cases will be simple like this, that when you explain things, things will be hard. She gave decision proof that she loved Christ more than father or mother. Her example united with the efforts of the rest of us at this station is beginning to exercise a redeeming influence in the female department of the church. Praise the Lord. But uh, notwithstanding these favorable signs, nothing really, nothing is yet done. And why? This mission and all other and all others must be sustained by continual supply of missionaries, male and female, from the mother country. Your sisters and daughters will continually come out to take the place of those who are removed by death and to occupy numberless stations still unoccupied. And when they arrive, they will be dressed in their usual way, as Christian women at home are dressed. And the female converts will run around them and gaze upon them with the most prime curiosity regarding them as the freshest representation of the Christian religion from the land where it flourishes in all purity and glory. And don't people say, if America, which has been blessed with the people who understand things, do such a things, who are we not to do them? I always say Kenya is a state of USA, but in another continent. Whatever happens in the USA, we'll just find it's happening in Kenya. Will not our brothers and our sisters in USA do something right so that it may be copied? That is our question. And when they see the golden jewels, Pendant from their ears, the beads and chains encircling their necks, the finger ring sets with diamond and rubies, the rich variety of ornamental headdress, the mantles and the wimples and the crisping pins, see the rest in Isaiah 3, they will cast a bitter, reproachful, triumphant glance at their old teachers and spring with fresh avidity to repurchase and resume their long neglected uh, allegiances. The cheering news will fly up to the die gang the lying boy and the salwen, the current cesses, will reload their necks and ears and arms and angles. And when, after another serious absence, I return and take my seat before the Burmese, Burmese or the current church, I shall behold the demon of vanity enthroned in the sand of the assembly, more firmly than ever, grinning defiance to the prohibitions of apostles and the exhortation of us who would fain uh, be their humble uh, flowers. And thus, you, my dear sister, sitting quietly by your fireside or repairing devoutly to your place of worship, do by your example spread the poison of vanity through all the rivers and mountains and wilds of this far distant land. And while you are sincerely and fervently praying for the upbuilding of the Demas kingdom, are inadvertently building up that of the devil. If, on the other hand, you divest yourself of all meretricious ornaments, your sisters and daughters who come hither will be divested, of course, the further supplies of pride and vanity will be cut off, and the churches at home being kept pure, the churches here will be pure also. You, you find, you get the reasoning of Jadison. Here we have our sisters and brothers coming from USA, and please allow me to say this, and they have all this money, and they are the ones that support things in Africa, but when they are there, the way they dress, when they come here, the way they dress, and be, because people want to give respect of people, they will not tell these sisters and brothers, you know, brother and sister, what you are dressed in 
is not in accordance with the word of God. They don't want to lose money. Many people don't want to lose money. And so they will not say these things. And so after these sisters go, we will find that our sisters in Africa put on the same things that these sisters put on. And you ask them, what is the matter? And they say, but didn't you see so and so? Did you speak to her? Or it is just us whom you hate and uh, you bow down to the whites. And so you wonder where to begin with this story. And so Jadison is saying, you sisters and brothers in America, when you put things in order, the very people who look on to you will put things in order. You influence them and you are bowing down, praying that the kingdom of God may be uh, uh, realized when actually you are building the kingdom of the devil inadvertently. Why? Because you will not do a dress reform. And how many things have we seen in the social media? People doing, and they are the very people who goes to continents to preach and baptize and do these things. And they go to a place, things are at least okay. When they leave, things are much worse. Because people say, if so and so is a preacher and is doing this, who am I not to do this? So, dear sisters, having finished my tale and there inexhibited the necessity under which I lay off addressing you, I beg leave to submit a few topics to your candid and prayerful consideration. One, let me appeal to conscience and inquire, what is the real motive for wearing ornamental and costly apparel? Is it not the desire for setting off one's person to the best advantage and of exciting the love and admiration of others? Is not such a dress calculated to gratify self-love, to, to cherish sentiments of vanity and pride? And is it not the nature of these sentiments to acquire strength from indulgence? Do such a motives and sentiments comport with the meek, humble, self-denying religion of Jesus Christ? I will here respectively suggest that this question will not be answered so faithfully in the midst of company as when quite alone kneeling before God. So don't answer these things in company. Go down, kneel in your house and ask the Lord, why am I doing this? He continued to say, consider the words of the apostle quoted above from 1 Timothy 2.9. I'll also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array. I do not quote a similar command recorded. I do quote, I do not quote a similar command recorded in 1 Peter 3.3, 3, because the verbal construction is not quite so definite, though the import of the two passages is the same. But cannot the force of these passages be elevated, evaded? Yes, and nearly every command in scripture can be evaded and every doctrinal assertion perverted, plausibly and handsomely, if we set above it in good earnest. But um, pre preserving the posture above alluded to with the inspired volume spread up open at the passage in question, ask your hearts in simplicity and godly sincerity whether the meaning is not just as plain as the sun at noonday. Shall we then bow to the authority of an inspired apostle, or shall we not? From that authority shall we appeal to the prevailing usages and fashions of the age? If so, please recall the missionaries you have sent to the heathen, for the heathen can vindicate all their superstition on the same ground. If you can give an excuse on the word of God and bring in a meaning of its own, don't, don't trouble the heathen. They can also give an excuse of what they do. And you have no reason, you have no power to challenge them otherwise, because also you challenge people on plain things. Jadison continues, O oh, Christian sisters, can you hesitate and ask what you shall do? Be deal those ornaments with the tears of contrition, concentrate them to the cause of charity. We shall soon appear before the judgment seat of Christ to be tried for our conduct and to receive the things done in the body. Will you then wish that in defense of his authority you had adorned your mortal bodies with gold and precious stones and costly art, cherishing self-love, vanity, and pride? Or will you wish that you had chosen a life of self-denial, renowned the world, taken up the cross daily, and followed him? And as you will, then wish you had done. Do now. This is, dear sisters, your affectionate brother, 
in Christ A. Jadison Mullen, October 1831, and then uh, 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 published in uh, Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald by uh, July 8 by James White. I think if I have read this letter in haste, you can still request it. You can still request it and uh, I'll be able to send unto you because this is not a simple matter. This is a grave matter that um, we are talking about. And I wish I knew it's not something that we want to say in the near future. We want to say that before probation closes and rectify everything that we can rectify in closing. Mother, do you want your child to live and wear the bloom of health? Then teach her to dress healthfully. If you love her and desire her good, why do you teach her by your example that it is no sin to mar the human form divine? What reason can you render to the creator for deforming his handiwork? Turn away from the fashion plates and study the human organism. We are fearfully and wonderfully made and we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. How can Christian mothers be worshippers at the shrine of fashion and yet preserve their loyalty to God of heaven? It is impossible. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Luke 16, 13. You cannot devote your time and talents to the world and yet keep your mind and body in a condition to do the work committed to you of training your children for God and aiding them in physical development that shall be a blessing to them to the end of life. Again, vanity of dress. All the arrangements of dress to appear younger than you are will be of no avail. Manuscript 47, 1892, paragraph 9. So people think that they will achieve anything by trying to look young. No, this is going to end in vain. And so, where did we start and where do we end? There is no need to make the dress question the main point of your religion. There is something richer to talk of, talk of Christ, and when the heart is converted, everything that is out of harmony with the word of God will drop off. It is not your dress that makes you of value in the Lord's sight. It is the inward adorning, the graces of Christ, of the Spirit, the kind word, the thoughtful consideration of others that God values. And so here we are and we can do no more. May God help us that we shall reach the standard that he is. And when the hearts are converted, we shall see these things starting to follow. And so what we are addressing is not the dress question per se, but the condition of our hearts. Everyone has to ask themselves, is my heart given to God? And if you find that you are still enjoying this vanity of dress, then understand that you have not given self to Christ and sacrificed your heart to be used by God and may the Lord be with us and speak to us in a new way that uh, will refresh our commitment and to him. Otherwise, I may have spoken words that are so weightier, but then I pray however weightier they are, you will consider them and pray for me. I pray for you and all of us that we may give our hearts to God so that when he comes, there may be still nothing on us that Satan claims us his own. Shall we pray? Dear Father, much can be said, but after it has been said and done, what remains, what have we done with the lights that we have received? And so I pray today and now that uh, you will start with all of us, even me, the church, before we go to the world. The Lord, after being converted, we can do a thorough work in this world. In this world of confusion, where Babylon is being rebuilt and people are of one mind and one language, and Satan is determined, even if it were possible to deceive elect, may you have mass upon the church in Jesus' name. Amen.